Hello, and thank you for listening to the Women's Bible Study from La Jolla Presbyterian Church for March 28, 2018. Our teacher is Cynthia Blaze, and we're going through the story, a 31-week journey through the entire Bible. This week, we're looking at chapter 26, The Crucifixion of Jesus. It's some of the darkest days in the Bible, but prepares us for the glory of Easter coming next Sunday. If you're local, please join us for Easter morning worship services. On Sunday, April 1st, Easter morning, we'll have four services. A 7.30 a.m. sunrise service in the sanctuary, our traditional 8.45 a.m. service, a 10 o'clock contemporary service in Fellowship Hall, and the 11 a.m. service back in the sanctuary. We hope to see you, and Happy Easter! Hi, everyone. Welcome to the podcast-only edition of our Women's Bible Study. Let us follow in the Story Sermon Series. This week, since it's spring break, we are not meeting, but there's no way we can miss this week because we're talking about the crucifixion, which is pretty much the most important week when it comes to the story of Jesus. So please listen in and enjoy this podcast version of our study. One thing I wanted to mention is that I'll be referring to a map of Jerusalem during the time of Jesus that was created by Logos Bible Software a number of times during this study. I've emailed that out to those on my mailing list, and I'll also leave a number of them in my box at the church if any of you would like to pick one up. Okay, let's dive in. So for the last five weeks, we've been looking at the person of Jesus. We have seen Jesus be baptized, seen him call his team of disciples together. We've seen Jesus start doing these crazy healings, but also start using language that sounds blasphemous. When he heals the paralytic man, he tells him, your sins are forgiven. But wait, the religious leaders say only God can forgive sins. How can this man forgive sins? Isn't it blasphemous for a man to claim to be God? They are all okay with healings because others do miraculous healings like Elijah and Elisha, but they are not okay with a man saying he can forgive sins. We spent time looking at Jesus' ministry in the Galilee area, outside the spiritual center of Jerusalem, and close to the town where he was from, Nazareth. We saw Jesus divide the loaves and fish and walk on water, and we read the story of the Good Samaritan. We talked about how loving our neighbor is loving those hardest to love, those different from us. I told you all that I personally find this commandment freeing. My job is not to judge or choose who I associate with. My job is simply to love. We also saw how in the Galilee area, Jesus had to keep evading the crowds because they wanted to take him by force to Jerusalem to make him king. These masses were looking for a new king from the line of David to bring back a religious kingdom, independent and magnificent like in the time of David. The problem was, Jesus also started making these claims to be God, telling them that I am the bread of life that has come down from heaven. When Jesus makes these I am statements, they should remind us of Moses and the burning bush, of how God told Moses to tell the Israelite people, I am has sent you. This alarms many people, and especially the Jewish leaders. Crowds like miracles and healings, but they don't like Jesus claiming to be God. And if he is this Messiah, why doesn't he go to Jerusalem and crown himself king? Last week, we saw Jesus first enter Jerusalem incognito at the Feast of the Tabernacles. Remember how I mentioned that there were three pilgrim festivals a year where all Jewish males were supposed to appear in the temple and make certain sacrifices? These were the Feast of the Tabernacles, Passover, and the Feast of Weeks. People are asking, will Jesus come? Because all the Jewish men were supposed to come. And when he slips in and starts teaching, he anchors the religious rulers by condemning them and by claiming to be sent from God and to know God and that they, the religious leaders, don't know God. Guards are sent to arrest Jesus, but these guards come back saying, no one is ever taught like this man. The masses almost stone him, but Jesus slips away into the wilderness, as his time has not yet come. Jesus stays in the wilderness for a while, but something is going to call him back to Jerusalem. It will be his love for a brother and his two sisters. We read the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. How the sisters send word to Jesus to come because his friend is dying. And when Jesus comes to the town of Bethany, four days later, which is only 1.5 miles from Jerusalem, Lazarus is dead and buried. Both sisters say to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus says to Martha, do you believe your brother will rise? And she says, yes, Lord, I know at the resurrection, just like the Pharisees say. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? 
And Martha has this great confession of faith, just like Peter did, saying, I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God. I mentioned last week how Jesus is very clear about who he claims to be. He never says, I'm a great prophet or a great teacher. C.S. Lewis writes in Mere Christianity that Jesus was either liar, lunatic, or Lord. Jesus clearly claims to be God, so he either was a total liar, completely insane, or actually the Lord of all. After this miracle, Jesus returns to the wilderness, but once again, a pilgrim festival is approaching. This time, it's the Passover. Again, all the crowds in Jerusalem start asking if Jesus is going to come. We learn that he first goes to Bethany and dines with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. This was when Mary pours pure nard on Jesus' feet, an ointment used on the dead in their burial process. And the next day, Jesus goes to Jerusalem publicly and rides on a young donkey to fulfill the scripture that the king will come riding on a young donkey. When the crowds go crazy, they got to meet him, waving palm branches and yelling, Hosanna, meaning save us, and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. When we talked about how from these words, we see the people calling Jesus the new king, the Messiah from the line of David to come. And the Pharisees say, this is getting us nowhere. The whole world has gone after him and they plot to kill Jesus. Remember how we have talked about that what the Jewish leaders wanted the most above everything else was to preserve their temple and their semblance of independence under the Roman Empire. They say in John eleven forty eight, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. After this, they begin to plot in earnest for a way to arrest Jesus in private when the crowds aren't around. And one of the twelve, Judas, goes to the chief priest and agrees to help them find a way to arrest Jesus privately. This is where we'll pick up the story today. Today we are going to look at what we call the Last Supper, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and it's his crucifixion. Get ready, ladies. This is going to be the saddest and hardest week yet. But as Tony Campolo likes to say, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. All right, so the time of the festival has come, and Jesus and his 12 disciples are going to celebrate it together. Jesus tells Peter and John to go prepare it and tells them they'll find a certain man with an upper room all set and ready for them. They find it just as Jesus has said and prepare the meal. Now picture this scene. Jesus is with his 12 disciples, his 12 most trusted friends, and he knows it is his last night with them. What would be his final words to his disciples? What would be the most important teaching that he's going to leave with them? Let's pick up the story in John 13, verses 1 through 9 and 12 through 30. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Judas, Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Skipping down to verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so. For that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. I'm not referring to all of you. I know that I, those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill this passage of scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. I am telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Very truly, I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me. Whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he had said this, 
Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another, at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I would give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, What you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. Notice how it says in verse 3 that Jesus um, knows that God had put all things under his power, that he had come from God, and that he was returning to God. Jesus knows where he has come from, he knows where he is going, and he knows what he has to walk through to get there. He is very self-aware. We see Jesus get up and wash his disciples' feet before they start the meal. I looked up celebrating the Passover meal at the time of Jesus and thought I would mention a few things. Foot washing. This was a normal part of the Passover feast. Before they would begin the meal, a servant would come around and wash the feet of everyone there. We see Jesus take this role, role and Peter protest against it. Jesus was not a servant or a slave to them. It was not his job. But Jesus says he's leaving his disciples an example to follow. They should wash each other's feet. They should serve each other also. We see the disciples reclining as they eat also. Jews are told to eat the Passover meal reclining, as that is how free people eat. God brought them out of slavery, so they now eat the meal as free people. The Passover table was usually about 18 inches off the ground and would be surrounded by pillows. The guests would lounge on the pillows as they ate the meal, so they take their shoes off, relax, and enjoy the meal. One more thing to mention. Uh, people sat at the Passover meal in a specific order, either by age or importance. It is significant that John is the one sitting next to Jesus and that Peter is next to John. This says a lot about the intimacy of their friendship and of Jesus' trust in them. So the disciples are relaxed. They're enjoying being with Jesus. He hasn't been arrested. Things seem on the up and up. But Jesus, Jesus is going to drop a bomb on them. He is going to tell them that one of the twelve of them sitting there will betray him. John who calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved, rather than naming his own name, is seated next to Jesus. Peter is next to him. So Peter leans over and says, John, ask him who he means. And John does. And I wonder if it is an intimate answer Jesus gives, rather than a loud announcement when he says, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread. Jesus continues to teach the disciples. He continues to give them his last parting words. Even though the disciples don't realize at the time that these are some of the last moments that they will have together. I'm going to pick up our story in John 13, reading 33 through 14, 7. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, Where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, Will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Do not let your hearts be troubled, though. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be, may be where I am going. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. So how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. We see in this passage Jesus talking about a new command. 
In the past, we know that God gave the Israelites 10 commandments. The Pharisees expanded these 10 laws to 613 laws, which just elaborated on those 10 laws. Like, what does it mean to honor my parents? Or what is included in remembering the Sabbath and keeping it holy? The 613 laws were a guidebook to the 10. I did a little research, and these laws were not written in a um, generally in books, but were kept by oral tradition. Do you remember how in previous weeks I mentioned that the Pharisees elevated oral law to be of equal weight to the written law or the Pentateuch? The Pharisees were concerned with interpreting the law correctly, which is why these laws developed. And this was also, as I mentioned, a major rift between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the Sadducees did not put equal weight in these 613 oral laws. Because of that, the Pharisees were seen as the one who best kept the law of Moses. They focus intently on outward actions. In his conversations, Jesus boils all these down to two, two laws, love God, love others. And here, as Jesus talks about a new command, we see the core of his message, love one another. Other people will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus also tells the disciples that though he is leaving, he is going to prepare a place for them and he is coming back. The disciple Thomas says, how do we get to where you are going? And Jesus responds with, I am the way, the truth, the light. If you know Jesus, you know the father, the great Yahweh who made a covenant with Abraham and brought the Israelites out of the slavery from Egypt and gave them the land of Canaan and gave them kings and prophets and sent them into exile and brought them back. To know Jesus is to know this father, this same God. We're also told during the, this conversation that Peter will betray Jesus and he will betray him in a specific time period before the rooster crows. Interestingly, roosters served as very accurate time indicators. They typically crowed first at midnight and then at 3 a.m. Their crowing was so accurate that guards relied on roosters to signal a changing of the guards. The Gospel of Mark which, remember, is told from the perspective of Peter himself, as Jesus says Peter will deny him three times before the rooster crows twice, or before about 3 a.m. Mark also expands the conversation to say that Jesus tells all the disciples they will all fall away, to which Peter declares, even if all fall away, I will not. Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And Mark adds that all the disciples say the same. At this Passover meal is also when Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. Let's read Matthew 26, 26 through 30. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given things, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat. This is my body. When he took a cup and when he had given things, he gave it to them saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood. I have the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So Jesus takes the elements of the Passover meal, unleavened bread and wine. He first takes the bread and breaks it and then says, this is my body. And we get the sense that Jesus' body is about to be broken. Also notice the language Jesus uses with the cup. He says, this is the blood of the new covenant. Let's think about this for a minute. Jesus' blood is the blood of the new covenant. Throughout the Old Testament, we had the old covenant. We've talked about this covenant so much during this study. Remember the three Ps of place, progeny, and a greater promise. The Israelites had to be faithful to God alone. And part of their active faithfulness was to bring animal sacrifices to the temple on a regular basis. Over and over, priests would shed the blood of animals as a means for transferring sin. The sin of the person was put on the animal, and the animal was killed instead of the person. Also, remember how Jeremiah, who prophesied during the time of the exile, spoke about God bringing about a new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 reads, The days are coming, declares the Lord when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, even though I was a husband to them. 
this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I'll put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I'll be their God and they'll be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. When Jesus says, this is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do you see what he is referencing? He is saying that he is the new covenant predicted by Jeremiah and that his blood is going to be shed on their behalf. I'm not sure the disciples got it at that moment, but we see Jesus telling them plainly what is about to happen and why it is significant. After the disciples and Jesus eat the Passover meal, they all go up to the Mount of Olives towards Bethany to a place called Gethsemane. You can see on the map how they cross the Kidron Valley right outside the walls of Jerusalem and climb up to the Mount of Olives. Jesus tells eight of the disciples to wait while he goes to pray. Remember, Judas is gone and takes Peter, James, and John a little further, telling them to keep watch while he prays. The Gospel of John records the anguish prayer of Jesus. He prays for the disciples. Then he prays for all future people who believe in me through their message. He prays for all of us. Jesus asked God to take this cup from him, for him to now have to walk through what, for him to not have to walk through what he's about to go through. But ultimately, he surrenders his will to God, saying, yet not as I will, but as you will be done. It will be this spot, this quiet garden, where Jesus is alone with his disciples, that Jesus will see as the moment the guards can arrest Jesus safely without starting a riot. Jesus has asked his disciples to stay awake and pray for him, but it's too late and they are too tired and too human. And three times Jesus returns to them asking them to stay awake and pray for him. And three times he finds them sleeping. Let's join the story here, starting in Matthew 26, verses 45 through 56. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd, armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward and seized Jesus and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled to say it must happen in this way? In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But this is all taking place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. And all of the disciples deserted him and fled. Notice that a large crowd comes, armed with swords and clubs. The chief priests and elders are there. It seems that they were expecting a fight. All of them against Jesus and eleven disciples. Okay, doable. I doubt that they expected Jesus to just give up, just to give himself up to them. The passage says that a companion draws a sword and cuts off the ear of the high priest servant. From the other Gospels, we learn that that companion is Peter. Peter, who jumps out of the boat to walk on water and says he will never deny Jesus, that he will die for him, he's prepared for a fight and he grabs a sword. He is not going down quietly. The other Gospels also say that Jesus reached out and healed the ear of the man instantly. Notice how Jesus tells Peter to put away his sword. They can call 12 legions of angels to fight for him and defeat this group who just come with human swords and clubs. But so that the scriptures are fulfilled, Jesus will submit. And notice how the text says that all the disciples desert Jesus. Jesus is alone. And this mob is going to take him before the Sanhedrin, the ruling council made up of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the high priest Caiaphas. 
they're going to look for some charge to bring against him so they can ask Pilate to crucify him. The Jewish people were not allowed to impose the death penalty on their criminals. Only the Romans could. The Jewish rulers didn't like what Jesus was teaching, but they needed a charge that they could present to the Romans. So the council is going to confer, and Peter is going to follow from a distance. And remember, this is all happening in the middle of the night, before 3 a.m. I'm going to read from Matthew 26, 57 through 68. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. And they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Messiah, who hit you? So all of these people bring charges against Jesus, but none are ones that would hold up in a Roman court. Notice how they ask Jesus plainly, Are you the Messiah? And Jesus replies, You have said so, and he calls himself the Son of Man. I wondered where he had seen that phrase before and realized it's what Daniel calls the coming Messiah in his vision. Daniel seven thirteen through 14 reads, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was like a Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into in his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. The Jews of Jesus' era would have known the prophecy and would have understood that Jesus was calling himself God by using that title. The Jewish leaders instantly say, this is blasphemy, kill him. Right after this passage, we read about Peter denying Jesus three times. Three different people come up to him and say, weren't you with Jesus? Aren't you one of the disciples? Come on, you have an accent from Galilee. You are totally one of his. And Peter denies all three accusations. And as soon as he does, the rooster crows a second time. So we know it's somewhere about 3 a.m. at this point. The text says that Peter left the courtyard of the high priest and went outside and wept bitterly. And it's daybreak now, and the Jewish leaders are going to take Jesus to Pilate and demand that Pilate execute him. It's the first day of Passover, and the chief priests don't want to defile themselves by entering the home of a Gentile. So Pilate agrees to come outside to meet them, the steps of his residence, the Praetorian. The Praetorium was built on part of the old residence of Herod the Great and shared a courtyard with Herod Antipas. The two residences were only steps apart from each other. You can see them both cited on the map I provided. I also included a rendition of what the buildings most likely look like. Interestingly, Pilate normally resides in Caesarea, the Roman capital of Judea. And Herod resides in Tiberias on the Sea of Galilee. But both have residences in Jerusalem, and both of them are there for the Passover. Herod, as a Jewish man, would have been there since it was one of the mandatory pilgrim festivals. Maybe Pilate was there to keep the peace, since it's a time when there is a huge influx of people into Jerusalem. In this scene, Pilate appears very reluctant to press any charges against Jesus. And when he finds out that Jesus is from Galilee, he sends Jesus to Herod literally just across the courtyard. Remember that Herod Antipas was tetrarch over Galilee, ruling a quarter of his father, Herod the Great's kingdom. Since he rules Galilee, though still under an overarching Roman authority, Pilate wants to outsource Jesus to him. It's almost silly since 
Pilate was the true ruler of all of Judea, even over Herod. But we see that Pilate doesn't want to deal with this Jesus guy. So he sends him off to Herod. Herod is thrilled to meet Jesus. Let's see how this encounter goes down. I'm going to read from Luke 23, 1 through 12. Then the whole assembly arose and led him off to Pilate. And there they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests in the crowd, I have no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted. He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. And hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he heard that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there, vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him, dressing him in an elegant robe. They sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. The Jewish leaders accused Jesus of opposing taxes and claiming to be king. They're hoping that a claim to kingship will be enough for Pilate to want him dead. But Pilate questions Jesus and doesn't find him to be a threat. When he learns Jesus is from Galilee, he sends him to Herod. Herod and his soldiers ridicule and mock Jesus. They put him in an elegant robe and send it back to Pilate. Herod knows that he can't execute Jesus. This is where the conversation between Pilate and Jesus gets super profound. In the course of their dialogue, Pilate asks, what is truth? I feel like that is a question that people ask all the time today in our pluralistic culture. You get the sense that the culture of the Roman era with their elaborate system of gods and goddesses was the same. So let's listen in starting in John 18 verses 28 through 40. By now, it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanliness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, We would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. We have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it that you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews, gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him, but it is your custom for me to release you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release this king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. And Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. So Jesus says, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. Then Pilate asks, what is truth? I wonder if he means that honestly. Is there one truth? What does it mean that Jesus is the truth? So Pilate still can't find a basis to kill Jesus and tries to set him free. There's a custom at Passover, apparently, to release one Jewish prisoner. Pilate tries to release Jesus, but the Jewish leaders and elders yell back, release Barabbas. As I was reading the text this week, it's the first time I noticed that the Gospels record that it is the chief priests and the elders that yell for Jesus to be crucified. I had always wondered why the Jewish people had turned on Jesus so quickly. It was only days before that Jesus had entered Jerusalem on the colt with the crowds waving palm branches. I had always wondered how the masses turned on Jesus so fast, but 
From reading this week, I realized it was the chief priests and the Jewish leaders that were yelling for Jesus' crucifixion. In Matthew 27, 20, Matthew adds, the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Remember, these chief priests were the ones the masses trusted to know the scriptures and to lead them in all incorrect understanding. I think it would be very hard to go against these leaders. In the Gospels, we see dissent among the masses. They keep asking, is this guy Jesus the Messiah? Last week, we read that they were wondering if even the chief priests and leaders were persuaded that he was the Messiah because they were letting him teach openly, not arresting him. But now they have arrested him and are saying that he needs to be killed. I am sure that they were of powerful influence. What was new to me was to realize that it wasn't the masses leading the charge. They're probably still wondering, is this the guy? But the Pharisees and the Sadducees are the ones that demand that Jesus be executed and stand in front of Pilate, demanding that Pilate do something. Pilate still seems to be trying to appease the crowd by having Jesus flogged and then continues to try to release him. Let's step back into the story and read the scene. Just a little background here on flogging. So flogging in itself was intensely brutal. Victims were tied to a post with their back fully exposed and were lashed 39 times with a leather whip containing pieces of bone and lead. The flogging literally rips off pieces of flesh with each strike. 40 lashes was, were considered imminent death. So the tradition came to flog people 39 times so you would leave them within an inch of death but still alive. Many people did die even before the 39 lashes were done. So let's read John 19, 1 through 16. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. Once more Pilate came and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officers saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I have no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to that law he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and they went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which, is, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here's your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. Do you notice the argument that the Jewish leaders use in forcing Pilate to crucify Jesus? They tell Pilate that they have no king but Caesar, meaning they have no king but the current Roman emperor, Tiberius Caesar. The leaders say in verse 12, If you let this man go, you are no friend to Caesar. Anyone who claims to be king opposed Caesar. So since Jesus claimed to be king, Pilate had to have him killed, the Jewish leaders say. So it's no king, but Caesar is allowed in the Roman Empire. Pilate was directly responsible to Tiberius Caesar. My Bible notes commented, comment that Pilate may have been afraid of the Jewish leaders, afraid that they would draft a formal complaint against him if he allowed Jesus to live, which could cost Pilate his position and perhaps even his life. Pilate then brings Jesus out and sits in his official judge's seat to pronounce him innocent against the Roman government but he still hands him over to the crowd. Matthew 27, 24, and 25 adds, when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water, washed his hands in front of the crowd, and said, I am innocent of this man's blood. It is your responsibility. And all the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. 
Pilate releases Jesus to his soldiers to be crucified. Remember that he had already been flogged 39 times. He was so weak that the soldiers grab a man out of the crowd, Simon from Cyrene, and make him carry the cross up to the crucifixion spot, which would have been a hill outside the walls of Jerusalem. People were always killed outside the walls in a prominent spot where they would be seen by passerbys. The Romans liked to publicly show what happened to those who went against the empire. I'm going to read from John and Matthew as we step into this crucifixion scene. I'll go back and actually, sorry, between John and Luke, and I'll go back and forth between John and Luke and John and Luke, starting in John 19. The soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign for the place where the Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write, the King of the Jews. But this man claimed to be the King of the Jews. Now Luke 23, verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. When the criminals who hung there held insults at him, Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said. Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. For this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now John nineteen twenty five, Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. And then from Luke twenty three forty four. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurions, see, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness the, sign, the sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching these things. I know that's all heavy and hard for a lot of us to read in here. Let me unpack a few pieces of that. When someone was crucified, their wrongdoing was written on a board and nailed over their head, so it would have read, murderer or thief. But for Jesus, Pilate writes, king of the Jews. The Jewish leaders protest, saying, he's not our king. But Pilate says, what I have written, I have written. I also think it's interesting that this phrase is written in Aramaic and Latin and Greek. Remember, Aramaic came from the Persian Empire and became a prominent language of the people. Greek also was widely spoken, and the Greek Empire was the one that preceded the Roman. I've also mentioned how Koine Greek became the common tongue of the ancient Near East, even during the Roman Empire. Much of the New Testament is written in Koine Greek. Latin was the official language of the Roman Empire. That the phrase is written in all three languages shows what an incredible mix of people existed in this time period. And remember, it's Passover, so people from all over the ancient Near East have come to Jerusalem to celebrate it. All these people will witness the crucifixion and return to their own cities. Notice also that the people mock Jesus, saying, Save yourself. And notice how the two criminals hanging on either side of Jesus join in. One says, Save yourself, and me too. The other pipes in, tells the first to be quiet saying they are getting what they deserve. But this guy, Jesus, has done nothing. Then he turns to Jesus and says, Remember me. 
Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answers this criminal saying, today, today you'll be with me in paradise. Many scholars have noted this comment, noticing that heaven isn't just a future resurrection, as some have suggested, but immediate. So heaven is immediate. We also learn that a new heaven comes in the future when Jesus returns. John writes about this in Revelations, and we'll see that in a few weeks. After this conversation, Jesus turns his attention to his mother. We learn from this conversation that the Mar- that Mary, the mother of Jesus, her sister Salome, and two other women, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene, and the disciple John, are physically present when Jesus is being crucified. We know at least those five were there. The rest of the disciples were not, we're not sure, but four women and John were not afraid of the Romans or the Jewish leaders, and they were there. Jesus, as the oldest son, would have been responsible for his mother Mary, since Joseph was dead. Her care would have naturally fallen to Jesus' next brother, the next oldest, and we know he had at least two other brothers, James and, Je- and Jude, who write books of the New Testament. But Jesus doesn't leave them into their doesn't leave Mary in their care. We know they also weren't believers at this point, as we learn that his brothers become believers after his resurrection. Maybe it's that reason, or maybe it's another. But for some reason, Jesus leaves Mary in the care of John. We also learn that all this happens at about noon. Then darkness comes over Jerusalem. We learn from Matthew that about 3 p.m. is when Jesus gives up his spirit. Matthew says, there is also a loud earthquake and rocks split open. In that moment, the curtain in the temple is torn in two. Do you all remember what curtain this is? This is the curtain that divides the inner part of the temple, the most holy place where the menorah stood, where the priest would enter daily, from the most holy place, where God's presence was supposed to dwell and where the high priest could enter only once a year. Do you remember what we said this signifies? Through Christ's death, there is no longer division between God and humankind. God is saying that all people can dwell in his presence, not just the high priest. Remember how Jeremiah prophesied that all people will know God in this new covenant. This is huge. The curtain has been in place since the tabernacle was built. Moses died in 1406 BC and the tabernacle was built before then. So we've had at least 1400 years of this curtain being in place separating a holy God from an unholy people who could never get it right, who could never worship God and walk in his ways perfectly on their own means. But now the separation is gone. Because of the death of Jesus, we learn from the book of Hebrews that we can now draw near to God without fear. Hebrews ten nineteen through 22 reads, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open to us through that curtain, that is, his body. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. Let's conclude today with reading about the burial of Jesus. Notice who comes to collect Jesus' body. I'm going to read from John 19, 38-42. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and the garden a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. So who comes for Jesus? We learn that a rich man named Joseph of Arimathea puts Jesus in his own family tomb. That's elaborated in some of the other Gospels. And we learn that the Pharisee Nicodemus helps. Remember him? Nicodemus is the one who first came to Jesus at night, saying, How do I be born again? He is the one who last week we read about stood up to the Sanhedrin and said, We can't condemn someone without first hearing from him. And remember how the council shames him and says, Are you a Galilean too? The same man comes in the middle of the day with Joseph, and the two men wrap Jesus according to Jewish burial customs and leave him in Joseph's tomb. They do it quickly because it's Friday, almost sundown, and the Sabbath will begin, and they can no longer do any work. 
Matthew and Mark add that Joseph rolls a large stone in front of the tomb and that both Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary Magdalene saw where Jesus was laid. We're going to have to sit in this moment for a week now. Sometimes I think it's good to sit in the sadness. When I was in high school, I saw a film that depicted Christ's crucifixion and visually seeing it and sitting in those feelings caused me to rededicate my life to Jesus in a new and deeper way. Next week, we will get to look at the story of Christ's resurrection and the joy that comes with that. This coming Sunday, we will celebrate that resurrection when we celebrate Easter. I invite all of you to join us at La Jolla Presbyterian Church for Easter. We have traditional services at 7.30 a.m., 8.45 a.m., and 11 a.m. in the sanctuary, and a contemporary service in the Life Center at 10 a.m. There are children's programs during the 8.45 a.m. and 10 a.m. services. My family and I will be worshiping at the 10 a.m. contemporary service, and I invite you to join us there. If any of you ladies are meeting to discuss this podcast, here are some questions you can consider. One, what does Jesus mean when he says, I am the way, the truth, the life? Think about all three of those, way, truth, and life, and how they apply to our lives and our own faith journeys. Two, what did you learn about the story of the crucifixion from this week? And three, talk more about the meaning by the curtain, behind the curtain in the temple being torn in two. What does it mean that we now have full access to God? How do we enter into that in our everyday lives? Until next week, I pray you ladies have a joy-filled week. Experience the presence of Christ in your life. Choose gratitude and look for ways to bless others this week. My name is Cynthia Blaze, and I'm the Director of Women's Ministries here at La Jolla Presbyterian Church.